I'm sure you've heard about the groundbreaking discoveries made by the James Webb Space Telescope, which has detected well-developed galaxies in the distant reaches of the cosmos. These galaxies are observed as they appeared a very long time ago, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, a period when not just galaxies, but even stars were not expected to exist. This indeed challenges current cosmological models. Initially, I plan to dedicate this video to explaining the widely accepted cosmological model today, known as the Lambda CDM model, highlighting the contradictions posed by the James Webb discoveries, how these contradictions are being addressed within the Lambda CDM framework, and the potential modifications proposed by some scientists. However, as I started working on this video, I was surprised to find that the results of the same observations are often interpreted in unconventional ways. Headlines like, James Webb disproves the Big Bang Theory, are common examples. In reality, no modern observations call the Big Bang Theory, or more accurately, the theory of the expanding universe, into question. On the contrary, the more we study the universe, the more evidence we find supporting the Big Bang Theory. Today, no serious cosmologist doubts that we live in an expanding universe. Even proponents of alternative cosmological theories generally do not challenge this fact. Debates focus instead on the expansion's rate, causes, influencing factors, and consequences. In this video, I want to explain why scientists are so confident in this idea and to present the primary observational evidence for the expanding universe. Let's start with the origins of the Big Bang Theory. Like many aspects of modern science, it all began with Albert Einstein. In 1915, he introduced his general theory of relativity, essentially a new theory of gravity. At its core was the so-called Einstein equation, which describes how gravitational interactions behave depending on the distribution of energy in space, specifically rest energy or mass. Einstein's equation could describe the gravitational behavior of any system, including something as massive as the entire universe. From Einstein's perspective, his equation had one significant drawback. It did not allow for static solutions. The equation implied that the universe must either expand or contract under the influence of gravity. This clashed with the prevailing scientific belief at the time, which held that the universe was eternal and unchanging, a view Einstein himself shared. To align his equation with his cosmological beliefs, in 1917, Einstein added a term to his equation. Dependent on a constant he called lambda, this became known as the cosmological constant, or the lambda term. But in 1922, the Soviet scientist Alexander Friedman proposed that Einstein's original equations were correct and that the universe must be non-static, either expanding or contracting. This was a revolutionary idea for the physics of the time, as most scientists firmly believed in a static universe. Unfortunately, Friedman passed away from typhoid fever in 1925 at the young age of 37, just a few years before his groundbreaking hypothesis was confirmed through astronomical observations. Around the same time, astronomers developed methods to measure distances to other galaxies. As we discussed in another video, a link should appear on your screen, and to determine the velocities of these galaxies relative to Earth based on the so-called redshift, caused by the Doppler effect. It turned out that nearly all galaxies are moving away from us, and the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it is receding. This relationship, known as Hubble's Law after the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, who first published it, was the first experimental evidence of the expanding universe. After its publication, Friedman's model of an expanding universe gained widespread acceptance. However, not everyone was willing to accept the expanding universe model. In fact, the term Big Bang was coined as a form of mockery by one of Friedman's opponents, British astrophysicist Fred Hoyle, a proponent of the steady-state universe model. Another skeptic was the American astronomer Fritz Zwicky, a highly respected figure in the field, who proposed an alternative explanation for Hubble's law, the relationship between redshift and distance, that did not involve an expanding universe. He introduced the tired light hypothesis, which suggested that galaxies might actually be stationary, and the observed redshift of light could be explained by photons losing energy as they traveled through space. 
Indeed, we know that the kinetic energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency and inversely proportional to its wavelength. So if photons lost energy during their journey, their frequency would decrease and their wavelength would increase. Logically, the farther the light traveled, the more energy it would lose, causing light from more distant objects to tire and redden more. A plausible explanation for the observed redshift distance relationship without invoking the idea of an expanding universe. At that time, physicists were already aware of processes in the universe that could lead to such energy losses. One potential mechanism for the tired light hypothesis was Compton scattering, in which light interacts with interstellar gas and dust, causing an increase in its wavelength. This process is indeed observed in our own galaxy, where light from distant stars is slightly reddened due to such scattering, a phenomenon known as interstellar reddening. If starlight within our galaxy could tire and redden, why couldn't light traveling vast distances across the universe do the same? Zwicky's tired light hypothesis became a lifeline for proponents of a steady-state universe. And for a time, the model of a stationary universe with tired light was a serious competitor to Friedman's expanding universe model. However, over time, mounting evidence revealed that the observed redshift of galaxy light behaves differently from what the tired light hypothesis would predict. Well, first of all, for Compton scattering to cause light to redden as much as it does, the intergalactic medium would need to be sufficiently dense, substantially denser than it is according to all observations. Moreover, the law of conservation of energy cannot be ignored. If this medium were to absorb a significant amount of energy from light, it would heat up and itself become a source of thermal radiation, which we would observe. However, we do not see this. All our observations of the intergalactic medium indicate that it is, first, extremely rarefied, containing approximately 1,000 atoms per cubic meter, and second, very cold. Secondly, Compton scattering would lead to a blurring of spectral lines, with the effect becoming stronger the farther the light source is from us. However, this does not happen. In the spectra of both nearby and very distant objects, spectral lines remain sharp and well-defined, shifting precisely as they should according to the law of redshift. Thus, it became clear fairly quickly that Compton scattering alone in the intergalactic medium could not account for the observed reddening of light. If the observed redshift were indeed caused by tired light, this fatigue would need to occur through some other mechanisms. However, proponents of the tired light theory were never able to propose such mechanisms. Even today, there are compromise models suggesting that the redshift effect might be partially explained by the expansion of the universe and partially by tired light, leading to different estimates of the universe's rate of expansion, its age, and distances within it. However, the fact that the universe is expanding is no longer in doubt, even among supporters of the tired light hypothesis. Over time, other observational evidence beyond redshift began to emerge, supporting the idea that the universe is indeed expanding. One such piece of evidence was the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation in 1964. A faint radio signal with nearly uniform intensity coming from all directions in the sky. This radiation was predicted 18 years earlier, in 1946, by George Gamo, a Soviet physicist who had emigrated to the United States. Gamo reasoned that if the current cold and rarefied universe resulted from the expansion of a primordial universe characterized by high density and energy, then in its original state, the matter of this universe must have been very hot, essentially forming a high-temperature plasma. Such a plasma, at sufficient temperature and density, would be opaque to electromagnetic radiation. Simply put, photons in such an environment would not be able to travel significant distances without being absorbed by matter and then re-emitted, only to be absorbed again almost immediately. Similar conditions exist today in the interiors of stars. As the universe expanded, its density and temperature would decrease, and eventually, there would come a moment when the matter would become transparent to electromagnetic radiation, allowing it to escape from the confinement of matter and travel freely through the ever-expanding universe. What we call the cosmic microwave background radiation consists of photons that were released approximately 13.5 billion years ago 
and have been traveling to us through the expanding universe ever since. We know the conditions under which plasma becomes transparent to electromagnetic radiation. This occurs at a temperature of about 3000 Kelvin. At this temperature, the average wavelength of the cosmic background radiation would have been around 1000 nanometers. However, as this radiation traveled to us, the universe's space continued to expand and the radiation's wavelength increased. Today, the average wavelength of the cosmic microwave background radiation is about 1.9 millimeters, indicating that since the radiation was released during the so-called last scattering, the size of the universe has increased approximately 1,000 times. The existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation proves that the universe was much denser and hotter in the past than it is now. To have become the way we observe it today, it must have expanded and cooled. Therefore, the very presence of the cosmic microwave background radiation is evidence of the universe's expansion. Studying its parameters allows us to learn much about how this expansion occurred, but we will discuss that in detail another time. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation solidified the expanding universe theory as the dominant cosmological model. However, skeptics were not entirely convinced. For example, some doubted that the cosmic microwave background radiation necessarily represented the echo of the Big Bang, proposing other potential explanations for its existence. Why couldn't it, they argued, simply be the extremely tired light of countless ultra-distant galaxies in an infinite and eternal universe, too far away for us to distinguish? Others suggested that the intergalactic medium itself could be the source of the radiation, illuminated, for instance, by Compton scattering. Although there were thermodynamic and electrodynamic objections to these hypotheses, they could not be completely ruled out, and the Big Bang theory certainly required additional evidence. One such piece of evidence emerged in the 21st century with the discovery of the so-called baryon acoustic oscillations, predicted back in the 1970s. To understand what they are, we need to revisit the era before the last scattering and examine the behavior of matter in the early hot universe. At that time, the universe consisted of hot plasma permeated by electromagnetic radiation, a kind of photon gas. Matter was drawn together by gravity, but the photon gas counteracted this compression, acting like an elastic medium. A similar balance is observed today in stars, which maintain stability due to the equilibrium between the inward pull of gravity and the outward radiation pressure. This created a so-called baryon photon fluid in which elastic density waves, essentially acoustic or sound waves, could propagate. These waves had density maxima, where matter was denser, and density minima, where it was less dense. At the moment of last scattering, when the universe became transparent to photons, the photon gas lost its elastic properties and the propagation of density waves, baryon acoustic oscillations, ceased. However, the traces of these waves were preserved in the form of non-uniform density distribution, which remained as it was at the moment of last scattering. Simply put, certain regions of the universe corresponding to the maxima of these acoustic waves, had slightly higher densities of matter, while others, corresponding to the minima, had slightly lower densities. As the universe continued to evolve, stars, galaxies, and other similar objects formed more frequently in regions of higher density, while areas of lower density had fewer such objects. This means that the distribution of galaxy clusters across the sky should not be entirely uniform. We should observe more and less densely populated regions arranged according to periodic patterns corresponding to the wavelength of baryon acoustic oscillations in the early universe. Naturally, these patterns would be scaled up due to the universe's expansion. In 2005, two independent studies, Sloan Digital Sky Survey SDSS and 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey, confirmed the existence of precisely such patterns in the density distribution of galaxies and their clusters. They found that the density maxima and minima were separated by approximately 150 megaparsecs. Since the universe is estimated to have been about 1,000 times smaller at the time baryon acoustic oscillations ceased, the original wavelength of these oscillations would have been around 150 kiloparsecs. 
The discovery of baryon acoustic oscillations, or rather their imprints on the cosmic map, was a major milestone in cosmology. By studying these imprints, we can learn a great deal about the parameters and history of our universe. For instance, they are used to estimate the Hubble constant and even its potential variation over time. We will explore what baryon acoustic oscillations have already revealed and what we hope to learn from them in future discussions. For now, the key takeaway is this. The existence of baryon acoustic oscillation traces clearly indicates that the universe was once an elastic medium where such waves could propagate. Today, it no longer possesses those properties, meaning its characteristics have significantly changed over time. This refutes steady-state universe theories and together with other observations, supports the Big Bang theory. However, perhaps the most convincing evidence for the expansion of the universe, at least in my personal, subjective opinion, is another phenomenon, the so-called time dilation of distant cosmic events, such as supernova explosions. These spectacular cosmic events, about the physics of which we have a separate video, are relatively fleeting by cosmic standards. The rise in brightness typically takes a few days, followed by a peak that lasts several weeks, and then a gradual decline over the course of several months. It turns out that the farther a supernova is from us, the slower all these processes appear to unfold. The rise to maximum brightness takes longer, and the supernova remains at peak brightness for an extended period. This phenomenon is easily and naturally explained within the framework of the expanding universe theory. Indeed, let's consider the star in its own frame of reference. During the explosion, it emits a certain number of photons that fill a region of space with a length equal to the duration of the explosion multiplied by the speed of light. If the universe were not expanding, an observer on Earth would see the supernova for the same amount of time as the explosion lasted since the photons would pass by Earth at the speed of light. However, due to the expansion of the universe, the segment of space occupied by these photons increases over time as they travel toward Earth. As a result, the time it takes for the photons to pass by Earth also increases, stretching the observed duration of the explosion. The farther away the source of the photons, the longer they travel to us, and the more the segment of space they occupy stretches. Consequently, the observed duration of the explosion increases as well. And this is exactly what we observe in practice. The tired light theory, on the other hand, cannot explain this phenomenon. According to it, the light from the explosion should only redden, but the duration of the explosion should remain unchanged. Yet, it changes, and this serves as strong and clear evidence that the universe is indeed expanding. Thus, only the theory of an expanding universe allows us to simultaneously explain all observed cosmic phenomena. On the other hand, we have not encountered a single phenomenon that falls outside this concept or contradicts it. This is precisely why today, the expansion of the universe is not disputed by any serious expert in astrophysics or cosmology, simply because arguing with the obvious is both pointless and foolish. At the same time, questions about how exactly the universe expands, the rate at which this expansion occurs, how this rate has changed in the past and might change in the future, and the processes that took place in the expanding universe. These are areas where there are numerous opinions, competing theories, and sometimes not fully explained observational and experimental data. And it is about these complexities, contradictions, and mysteries that we will definitely talk in our future videos. If you enjoyed this video and like what we do on our channel, I'd be delighted if you decide to join our sponsors, either here on YouTube or on our pages on Boosty or Patreon. A huge thank you to everyone who is already supporting our project and to those who choose to join our sponsor club today. Wishing you all the best, happy new year, and see you in future videos on our channel.